I'm Sam. Uh, I'm head of the Living Collections here. Welcome to our incubator and rearing room. So we originally had our incubator and rearing rooms at our off-site facility. Uh, two problems with that, it was a little bit too far to go all the time checking on the babies because when they're hatching you can be checking them every five to ten minutes sometimes. And the other reason yeah, is so that uh, the public could see what we're doing. It's really important for you guys to be able to see what we're doing, how we're managing things, how we're supporting breeding programs. So again, you can now see on a day-to-day -day basis what myself and my team are doing. Uh, this uh, completed last summer, uh, June of 2024, um, and we used it just at the end of the breeding season. Uh, we're getting full experience this year. We've had a few babies already through it, including Nene and Swan Geese. So we make a decision about what eggs we're going to bring into the incubator room or not. Um, it's based on a case by case. Uh, sometimes uh, if they're in a big open exhibit and there's lots of birds in there, just to safeguard those birds, we might bring those eggs in and put them into the incubators. We've got six golden eye in our hatcher at the moment. Uh, these were eggs from Lakes and Forests exhibit. Uh, critically endangered species and breeding programs again we'll keep a close eye on those if we can we'll parent rear every time uh, that's what the duckery is for and we've also got offshore areas at coastal creek uh, designed for things like our scaly sided magansas that are beautiful ponds that mum can rear in peace So we rear the babies in these, uh, what they're called Arnie tanks, uh, after the person that designed them. Uh, you can have them as a dry rear tank or a wet rear tank, which basically means the geese, they have a dry rear and they have grazing trays in there. And then for the diving ducks and the sea ducks, we can have a nice little pond in there that they can bob about until their heart's content. Hi, I'm Mara and I'm the Living Collections placement here at Arundel WWT. Uh, so we're in the duckery. Our duckery is one of our off-show exhibits where we keep birds that um, are from last year's babies that are growing up to be a year. We also have our parent rearing birds as well and any birds that we've uh, incubated. We also do have birds here that um, need a little bit of TLC um, and a little bit of medical care as well. So we have the uh, swan geese babies in here. So we have mum and two babies that uh, are parent reared. And then we also have um, our nene. So we have two baby nenes as well with mum and dad who are also being parent reared in our duckery. So this exhibit we use after uh, we've incubated our eggs in our rearing room and they spent some time in their Arnie tanks uh, growing up a little bit and making sure that they're okay. They come into our duckery where they spend some time uh, getting used to being with other birds, getting used to being on grass and just growing up a little bit before they go on our open exhibits or other exhibits or to other WWT centres. Hi, I'm Adam, a Reserve Manager at the London Wetland Centre. I'm just going to talk to you today a little bit about what we're doing this spring on the Reserve. So first of all, we're going to have a look at one of these water sluices. Um, We've got to control some of the water that's coming into the reed beds to keep them healthy and subsequently what the, the water that comes into our main lake as well. So we're, we're after two different uh, water levels at the moment. So um, yeah, I'm just going to pop down here and adjust this sluice at the moment. So what we've done here, we've put a plug in the top of the uh, top of the sluice to stop so much water coming into the main reed bed uh, and that's important because the reed beds feed into our main lake uh, and we're trying to get the main lake level down a bit at the moment for our spring waders that are, are passing through so uh, yeah we're just uh, just shutting the water off here at the moment just manipulating the water levels we're in the reed beds at the moment what we're looking for here are and we're listening for uh, singing reed warblers, singing reed buntings, chetty's warblers, species like that. They're all form, forming part of our breeding bird survey that we do uh, at least once a fortnight. And, and actually we can see there's a couple of reed bunting sitting up in them willows at the moment. Uh, reed warblers are a little bit harder to spot, but we're, we're mapping them out um, by the number of singing birds that we can hear. Uh, so it's it's looking pretty healthy so far this spring for reed warblers. We're already up to over 50 pairs 
and, and hopefully if we have a good season, we might have over 70 or 80 breeding pairs, which would be, which would be great. Um, Reed Bunting's, of course, not doing too well in the UK, so it's nice to hear that we've got a few pairs of them uh, singing away at the moment. They quite like these alder trees as well. They like a few trees in the reed beds uh, to sing from a perch. Um, if we're really lucky, we'll hear some squealing. It could be the water rails making a few contact calls. You may even hear their little bit of singing from them. Um, and they're definitely out there somewhere, hidden away. There's also been a few pairs of potchard in these reed bed channels. The females are already going on to nests. Um, they're a really important species for us. You know, red data list species. Um, and they say they'll be, they'll be hidden out of sight, but you'll often see those males hanging about just outside the edges of the reeds because uh, his mates hopefully sitting on a nest with some, with some good eggs in there. If we're lucky, there might be the odd gargany that will come and have a go at nesting. Um, we don't often get them breeding, but they'll definitely be passing through uh, late April into May. Um, so fingers crossed we might see a bit of gargany as well. So we're just having a look at one of our many water vole platforms we've got here. This is, forms part of a transect that we've got across the site. Um, you have a look at these platforms and it will show you if there's been basically any water vole poo left. Um, so it's a latrine site. And if you, if you do these regularly enough, once a month, it gives us a really good idea as to how many water voles we might have around the place. So just having a look here, this one doesn't look as though it's been visited recently but we know they're around in the general wildside area at the moment in, in small numbers. So we'll give this a bit of a cleaning off and that'll be all fresh for next time. So we're at this pool at the moment. We started doing our marsh frog surveys uh, as we do at this time of year. So there's some really good singing going on here. Uh, they're really hard to see. They just stay hidden in the edges, but we've got about a dozen marsh frogs uh, happily singing away here. So we'll go around the whole of wildside uh, and the other areas of the reserve and the rest of the site, seeing as if we can do a good old survey of these frogs and see how many we've got. Uh, we also do newt surveys, um, usually evening, uh, evening surveys to see how many of those we've got. And based on the last few years, there's a thriving population, which is really nice to be able to say. So these marsh frogs, they're, uh, as you call them, a naturalized species. Uh, they're originally from Southern Europe, really and they found their way up uh, and now they're a bit of a specialist of the south of England, southeast of England. Um, there's not so many of the old common frogs left but there's an awful lot of these marsh frogs around and uh, we've got a healthy population of smooth newts too, especially in some of the, the shallower, uh, shallower ponds that we survey. Hi, my name's Callum and I'm here at the London Wetland Centre. Uh, we're currently over just behind the San Martin nest bank um, we've kind of got them all flying around us at the moment. Um, sand muttons arrive here at the centre in March every year um, from Western Africa so they migrate here every year and they'll stay with us through to kind of end of August start of September. We get a lot of them on site um, they all use our artificial nest bank uh, uh, to make their nests. Um, we have about just under a hundred different nest chambers I think it's about 98 um, and it's they usually, it's usually about a 90 to 95% occupancy rate. So it's pretty well used. So we usually get a good, it's usually a good like 90 pairs every summer using it. So it's really successful, which is really great. And then those pairs will do two to three broods each. So we get a lot of little baby sand martins every year, which is great. They're really cool to watch flying around. They, I mean, you'll, you can see like 50, 60 all at once. Um, and it's kind of like, it's like a mini swarm. It's really cool to cool to watch. So the sand martins are really important in our food chain as well. They're um, they're eating all a lot of the little insects that you can't really see in the air. Um, and each sand martin might be eating thousands of those each day. So yeah, they're playing an important role in the ecosystem. Hi, I'm Sam. I'm a reserve warden here at State Marshes and we're here today to look at some of the great habitat we've got here for dragonflies. Okay, so some of the management work we do here on the marshes is sort of keep some of these waterways here quite clear. Um, that's quite good for dragonflies. Um, 
So in the autumn, we go in there with waders, um, with volunteers, and we clear it out by hand. This is probably the best sort of way of doing it without causing too much disturbance. But yeah, we cut the reed beds. Um, we've created these sort of shallow edges to the pools. Uh, this allows us to have some sort of nice species of plants and flowers, or wetland plants, um, which is great for dragonflies to emerge on in the spring and the summer. Um, so we get about 23 different species of dragonfly on the reserve. Um, this includes things like emperor dragonfly, broad-bodied chaser, um, red-eyed damselfly. So we're specifically trying to create a nice sort of mixture of different habitats, sort of a, sort of a mosaic of some sort of nice open fresh water, um, bits with lots of plants where things can, like larvae can come up and emerge from. Um, here we've got some great habitat, you know, sort of mixture of nice open big ponds, some nice little ditches hiding here and there. Um, sort of you can lose yourself all day here sort of trying to find dragonflies. I'm going to hand over to John now, he's going to tell us a little bit more about the dragonflies we get on the reserve. Hi, I'm John Van Gowler. I'm a professional ornithologist. That's a person that studies dragonflies and damselflies. Their ancestors have been on the planet for approximately 325 million years. So you can trace back their original ancestors to what we would call the Carboniferous period. The reason the dragonflies love steep marshes is because of the way it's laid out here, the vegetation, the wetlands side of it. There's so much wetland for them to oviposit in for their larva because the most important thing with dragonflies is their larva um, because they spend a lot more time in their larval stage, one year, two years, three years sometimes, depending on the species. And as an adult, only six to eight weeks if they're lucky. But there's absolutely so many different species here. We start off very early in the season with what is known as the hairy hawker or the hairy dragonfly. That's probably one of the first people we'll see. That's a very beautiful insect, but um, it's thorax and part of its abdomen is covered in quite a bit of hair. Um, so that's quite an interesting insect. Um, it's what is known as one of the mosaic hawkers because it has lovely mosaic patterns on its body. And as the season progresses, we get different hawkers here. Um, we get the um, southern hawker, we get the brown hawker, we get the migrant hawker. All wonderful insects, very large insects. And then of course the largest of them all, which is our emperor, the emperor dragonfly, Anax imperator, which is um, an absolutely wonderful insect and has um, been the inspiration for lots of people in the past for flight.